Christina Moon is the director of the MA Fashion Studies program at Parsons and assistant professor in the School of Art and Design History and Theory. She received her PhD from Yale um, in sociocultural anthropology and her doctoral dissertation is entitled Material Intimacies, Labor, Creativity and the Global Fashion Industry. Her work is fo focused on urban anthropology with a particular interest in the transnational study of labor and race within the global fashion industry and her ethnographic work has been undertaken in Hong Kong, Los Angeles, New York, Paris and Seoul. So I think she'll be bringing Asia much closer. So thank you both to Asim and Radhika for inviting me. It was really, really uh, exciting to, to have the opportunity to be a part of this uh, symposium back in the fall. Um, and it's been really incredible. We had, Vinayak and I had a conversation uh, back then and uh, it's just been uh, just, in, in thinking about this book and the way that it's set up thematically has been really, really fascin fascinating for me to think through in my own work and my own research. Um, so far we've talked about I think several things that uh, really speak to me. And if I have, uh, my original home is in anthropology uh, and as a now a professor in fashion studies, that's my second field, my second home. And I can say very much with uh, the symposium today, I hope that urban practices will also have me, you know, in as another home because it, all the things that we're talking about today is really, really just so exciting for me. Um, We've talked about bridging the gap between academia and practice. This is, as a young academic, uh, you know, this is my first job in, in the institution, and I'm very much being disciplined and institutionalized. Um, I, I'm struggling with, you know, I'm be, I'm str can I just be honest about that? Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I constantly struggle with this because, you know, as a graduate student, uh, uh, it was very important for me in taking on fieldwork projects uh, to really be, uh, to think about form. And since writing is my most favorite uh, form to articulate and express myself, um, it was always and has always been very important for me as somebody who is quote unquote an ethnographer. Um, to, to write in a way that um, is both my voice and also in a way where the people that I'm interviewing and spending time with also has access to that written word. And I think that's something that really gets lost when you have these professional demands and expectations of you. And we were talking about like, you know, the tenured book and the peer reviewed journals and you know, this and that. So something really gets l lost there that's, um, that I, I struggle to kind of recover, you know, in my in my work life and also in my role in, in as a researcher and a scholar. The other thing that's um, uh, interesting for me to think about is um, that Vinayak uh, brought up at the very beginning is this idea of Asia and Asian, and I'm constantly playing around with, you know, w what this is and what it means and how to unmoor it and put it back together. Um, so many of the papers today were also about lived experiences and whether that means uh, yeah, different manifestations, different material manifestations, different traces of that lived experience, and that is very much at the heart of my work, daily life and lived experience. Um, I'm also really um, interested in colonial and post-colonial histories and what I think that this book is doing that I think is really interesting is that it's trying to find more nuanced readings of that, of those kinds of histories and I I'm very much invested in that and, and those colonial and post-colonial histories very much inform my own research. And finally, um, one thing that was mentioned, and it kind of runs through that I, I think I'm going to bring to the forefront as well, is um, informal economies. Because what I'm going to be talking about to you today I is based on an informal economy of clothing in Los Angeles. And I know the poster says Guangzhou, but I'm going to get to it in, in a moment, if you'll just be patient with me. Um, but it, I'll be talking about fashion, fast fashion, and Los Angeles. But to talk about fast fashion in Los Angeles, you, you're talking about emerging Asian cities. So um, 
if you just be patient, we'll, I'll get to it, I promise. Um, okay, so my work is on um, fast fashion in Los Angeles. And um, one of the things that was uh, brought up in this book that really kind of struck a chord with me is, um, is that I think it really considers unexpected geographies and public spaces, sites that beg for, in the words of Vinayak, um, an analysis of alternative modes of urban practice and urban transformation. So I think what um, Vinayak and I share in our papers is this real interest for public space and cultural identity. Um, and I'm really interested in how cultural identities are performed and deployed across geographic locations and divides. Um, migrating from Asia and beyond to shape public spaces and urban landscapes within cities beyond, like in Los Angeles. So the first thing I have to do uh, is explain to you what fast fashion is. Um, it's fast fashion is clothing that you're probably wearing right now. It's clothing that's normally very inexpensive clothing that's bought for under $50. It's really trendy, it's made very quickly, it's sold for incredibly cheap prices. If you've obviously ever been on Union Square, all those different fashion retailers on Union Square are all fast fashion retailers. Um, stores like Urban Outfitters, Anthropology, Charlotte Russe, and Forever 21, which is right next to the Whole Foods Market on Union Square. And that's um, the largest fast fashion retailer within the US. It has over 400 stores globally. Um, and that store specifically has, has really changed the fashion industry within the US within the last decade. Um, it's also clothing that's really derided. It's considered knocked off or copied. It's considered made of really poor quality. It's very disposable and it's horrible for the environment. There are all kinds of labor issues involved, all kinds of ethical and moral issues involved. And yet so many people continue to buy it. Um, and I keep on asking myself why, and I also am, you know, I, I wear fast fashion cl uh, clothing myself. Um, so why? Because it's cheap and it, because it's accessible and because it's cool and most importantly because it's designed. Fast fashion clothing takes design off the runways and makes it affordable very quickly. It makes design incredibly accessible to the masses. And I kind of, you know, when I uh, do my intro de to design studies lecture, I kind of tell the students, it's sort of like Facebook. It allows you to buy all these different pieces of clothing at very affordable prices, so you can style yourself in this very highly expressive and curated way because you can afford to do so. Its um, appearance is an entirely new global phenomenon. It's emerged within the last 15 years, and it's really what I think is, um, what I'm so fascinated by is how much it's really changed our relationship to clothing, how much clothing we can buy, you know, how often we actually buy it, how often we wear it, how quickly we end up throwing it away. And it's, I think, really changed the way um, that people, what people expect when they buy clothing. People, I think today, young people no longer seek to buy quality clothing or clothing that's going to last. But they do expect to see lots of different designs on the store floor all the time and styles that capture the latest trends at very, very cheap prices. So um, that's what fast fashion is, and that's the industry that I'm looking at that I've become most interested in. Um, and one thing that's really interesting to me is that um, fast fashion, you know, we, we equate fashion in the US with New York City. Uh, New York is considered a global fashion capital. But when it comes to this kind of clothing, this uh, cheap kind of trendy mass-produced clothing, the center of um, this industry is not in New York, but it's in Los Angeles. And even more fascinating to me is that it emerges, it, the majority of it emerges out of an informal clothing market called the Jobber Mart, which is in downtown Los Angeles. So here's a little map um, of downtown LA. And um, and there is a formal, this is, uh, there's a formal fashion district uh, in downtown LA, but in the area that's not highlighted where that little dot is, is where the LA Jobber Mart actually exists. Um, 
this is the center of the wholesale fast fashion industry within the US. And there are over 6,000 vendors who operate their small family kind of mom and pop businesses out of this one neighborhood in little 500 to 1,000 square feet showroom stores uh, just in that one neighborhood. Here's um, just a view from uh, a sewing factory, inside a sewing factory. And uh, it's this entire area. And each one of these is, a, is one showroom wholesale store. And uh, yeah, here's another image. You can see the, all the different stores in those large buildings. Much of the much of the sewing factories have been uh, offshored from Los Angeles. Oh, all right, I'm I'm okay. Thank you. Um, and what's interesting about these fast fashion wholesale companies that are run by these families is that these businesses are able to quickly pick up on the most recent design trends. They also organize labor in Asia, mostly in China and Southeast Asia for production of clothing. And they connect with buyers in the US. And they have their merchandise in fast fashion stores within two weeks. That's why it's called fast fashion. So what traditionally would have taken um, three months time, that's from design to production to its selling. It's usually a three month process within fashion. These mom and pop family stores have managed to collapse that production time down to just two weeks. Um, here's a, what one of them typically looks like on the inside. Uh, yeah, these are, this is just shots of inside that, the, the market, the jobber mart. Um, oh yeah, and here's a, yeah, here's just a shot of kind of the action that's going inside a store. Okay, so one of the reasons why fast fashion is so fast is that they create their designs and styles before they're actually ordered from stores. So um, they actually create their designs and styles without ever knowing what's going to sell. And they store the merchandise in these back rooms so that when buyers put in their orders, they just need to go into the back, pack up the orders, and ship it out on the very same day. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is that, sorry, the thing that I want to emphasize is that um, you really needed to have done your research on design and current design trends, because every style is considered a risk. The profit margins for these family businesses are incredibly slim, and you make huge gambles every time you create a style. And these wholesalers are the ones who absorb all the risk. And what I find so fascinating is that the clothing that's designed, made, and distributed from this informal clothing market is made mostly by Koreans and Korean Brazilian Americans. They've come from cities in Korea who that rapidly urbanize, industrialized from the 1960s to the 1980s through garment production, whose social practices and the making of fast fashion have transnationally moved with them from Asia to South America, then to the US, across continents, across new cities, establishing and reshaping urban markets and public spaces along the way. And now, whose cultural, constructed cultural identities as Asian, quote unquote, actually play a central role in the making of new relationships with factories and production centers and garment cities across China and Southeast Asia. Um, so many of the vendors in this market, including the, a man who now owns and runs the largest jeans factory within the US, which sits right outside of this market, and fast fashion retailers like Forever 21, which is the largest fast fashion retailer in the US, have all began in this market. They're part of a generation that have lived through mass industrialization drives set up by 26 years of military dictatorships, which put entire generations to work in garment factories all in the name of Korea's development and modernization. 
Um, and Korea's status as a modern economic miracle and Asian tiger economy was really only made possible through the development of its textile and garment industries and exports and clothing, industries which really existed because of incredibly oppressive labor laws. Um, and most of the vendors who are working here are folks who grew up in quote-unquote emergent garment cities such as Daegu and Seoul in the 1960s. They have memories of Seoul's Dongdaemun wholesale clothing markets, which still actually exist today, and whose stalls uncannily resemble the public space of the Jobber Mart in Los Angeles. There are a number of wholesale vendors who are Korean husband and wife teams who've left Korea. They lived in Brazil during the 1970s and 80s. They arrived in LA right after the Rodney King riots during the 1990s, and they set up shop in the garment district. And the cultural identities are their, of their children is what is very fascinating to me. It's deeply complex. These are children who've been raised at home speaking Korean and Portuguese. They've helped out in their parents' shop in LA speaking Spanish among Mexican workers. They're socialized at school to speak English. So these kids would eventually reach college age and they have, sought, they have gained degrees in design, marketing, merchandising, and business, and so many of them actually have come to Parsons. Um, and they've given up actual jobs on, corporate jobs on 7th Avenue for design companies to return to work for their parents' businesses in Los Angeles. And so much of my work is looking at the, this sort of recent coming together of different forms of knowledge and labor, of parents and their 30 years of manufacturing experience and factory relationships in South America, the US, and now Asia, along with the coming of age of their children who now have deg degrees in design and marketing and connections with the formal fashion world. And it's these two generations coming together, these different forms of knowledge, their division of labor, um, which I find so fascinating and which I argue is one of the reasons why fast fashion within this country is so fashionable and is so fast. Um, since the 2000s, these family businesses are now responsible for precipitating the offshore of their clothing production to factory cities along the Pearl River de Delta, a coast of China from Guangzhou to, Shangh to Shanghai. And it's really kind of interesting to be in the district during, you know, twice a month where you have these vendors taking trips from the LA Jobber Mart to Guangzhou to organize factory production. Um, and what has become really fascinating for me is that their business relationships, whether you, they are dealing with Korean Chinese agents or Korean Chinese clothing wholesalers or Chinese and Japanese factory owners in China, they rely on these di diasporic networks. Um, their relationships are entirely based on this idea that all parties are quote unquote Asian. And I just find it really fascinating that in this really anonymous landscape full of strangers where these business ties have to be made, it's really these performances of cultural identity, of shared race, ethnicity, or diaspora, which are strung together to create a very fictive sense of trust. So that's just a little bite of um, a much larger project. But um, what I actually want to say is, um, in terms of traditions, tensions, and transformations, is that I, too, am also interested in these critical counter-narratives to the modernity of Asian cities. And within that, I think I'm most interested in this idea, uh, I'm most interested in the migrating subject, the migrating subjects that these cities produce, whose very practices are born from colonial and industrial legacies and have moved with them to other places, in this case, to the city of Los Angeles, and who play a role in creating and reshaping that city's urban space through the LA Jobber Mart, and whose relationships are really now forming new economic and cultural ties between LA and emerging post-industrial cities in China and Southeast Asia. So I will, I have a lot more to say, but I'll just leave it at that and, uh, and hand it over to Vanayak. Thanks. Japan's defeat in World War II marked the end of a world. Tokyo, though spared of the atomic de destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, looked just as devastated. A fourth of the city raced to the ground. 
With the hardships and ultimate futility of war, even as the Japanese seemed ready for newer value orientations under a foreign power, the American occupation from 1945 to 1952 sought to insinuate not only a democratic political system, but also a democratic society and, and culture to support and maintain it. The emperor, who had not so long ago embodied divinity, was now reduced to a mere symbol. The armed forces were dismantled. The former Meiji constitution was completely revised and officially adopted uh, in 1946. The Diet was to be the Japanese parallel of Western parliaments. In short, the American occupation intentionally implanted and nurtured the first industrialized democracy in the non-Western world. If Japan represents the six decade long legacy of this Western implant, then the Japanese city represents the setting for examining its multifarious urban manifestations. The focus of this presentation is on examining public space, particularly in tracing the intellectual and formal search for expressions of democratic space within the end of World War II and the beginning of Japan's 1980s economic bubble and charting its transformations by complex post-democratic entities. The intention is to expand the rhetoric of a relatively understudied period of recent Japanese history and reflect more deeply on the forces and meanings of public space as seen in the Japanese city today. In 1949, the site of the Hiroshima bombing was memorialized into a public space, the Hiroshima Peace Park. It was designed by Japan's consummate modernist architect Kenzo Tange. Its triangular site was structured as a radial plan centered on a large trapezoidal green between the Memorial Museum to the south and a cenotaph to the north. The idea of a public park as a large social space was not new to Japan. Large semi-public gardens and parks typically associated with palaces, villas, and temples have been an intrinsic part of Japan's traditional social pattern. But the Peace Park was different in that it commemorated for the first time a narrative of public memory wherein the images and reflections and recollections of thousands of ordinary citizens would be translated into a single public setting of national importance. It was in this sense not only a special emblem of peace, but also of Japan's new democracy. But ironically, the park chose to prohibit public grieving for the effects of the bombing, a mandate that would have significant social consequences. As historian John Doe noted, I quote, suffering was compounded not merely by the unprecedented scale of the catastrophe, but also by the fact that public struggle with this traumatic experience was not permitted. With but rare exceptions, survivors of the bombs could not grieve publicly. They could not share their experiences through the written word. They could not offer or be offered public counsel of support. As the inaugural spatial manifestation of Japanese democracy, the Hiroshima Peace Park was fraught with complexities. If it embodied patriotism and peace, it also represented the failure to understand the difficult ways in which a wronged population attempts to communicate its trauma and loss. While peace remained its dominant message, its suppressed and manipulated forms of publicness were evident of an infant de democracy's poor cultural translation and the conflict between the universal need for critical memory and a less sanitized display of history. Formalizing democracy. Circa 1950, post-war democracy had printed a new picture in Japan. Overwhelming population increase and unprecedented economic growth had led to massive public housing schemes constructed by agencies all over Tokyo. This idea, among this rubric, the idea of the Western Plaza was an urbanist import alien that entered Japan, which was, which was alien to Japan's authentic traditions. In traditional Japan, the labyrinthine tenuous street, not the square, had been the center of civic life. In the stratified social structure of Japan with the emperor at its head, there was no communion in any democratic sense. And in historic capitals like Heijokyo, Nara, or Heiankyo, Kyoto, no conscious expression of any agora, piazza, or formal community space could be found. But recognizing the futility of seeking anything resembling a Western plaza in the historic cities, Japanese modern architects and urbanists of that time seemed all the more compelled to create spatial parallels. In 1970, the Osaka Expo is a case in point. The Omatsuri Hiroba, literally the festival plaza, an entity that existed in neither Japan nor the West, was placed at the center of this 815-acre future city. The 350 by 1,000 foot space was covered by the world's largest translucent roof of its time, a gigantic space frame, 100 feet high, supported by six pillars, 
Its centerpiece was the Tower of the Sun by Japanese sculptor Taka Okamoto. Taro Okamoto, a 230-foot tall sculpture with exhibits themed around the idea of the evolution of the future city. Meanwhile, the Tsukuba Academic Town, Japan's first real post-war nationally sponsored planning effort, had been envisioned as a holistic community around a central network of pedestrian decks and a large plaza. In 1983, following the failure of its initial phase, Arata Izosaki, one of Japan's most celebrated architects today, was commissioned to design the Tsukuba Plaza Hub. And he was keenly aware at this time of the seeming quirk within this plan. To build an elusive city in Japan, he thought, where there had never been a plaza, seemed like what he called a double fiction. He chose to celebrate this fictitiousness, consciously eschewing any element that appeared to be of Japanese origin. He took nothing less than Michelangelo's Campidoglio in Rome, a plaza in front of the Roman Senate, the image of which would later become the symbol of power for so many Western cities, and inverted it with surroundings that appeared to collapse, in his words, like Giulio Romano's work at Palazzo della Te at Mantua, with further quotes from Borromini and Ledoux. Even as this assemblage of the concert hall, information center, hotel, and shopping mall around a sunken oval plaza provoked international debate, Izosaki published renderings of the project's ruins quoting the 19th century neoclassicist Sir John Soane's rendition of the Bank of England. Performing democracy. In the early months of 1969, 7,000 anti-Vietnam War activists, calling themselves the Tokyo Folk Guerrilla, crowded the subterranean plaza and passageways of Shinjuku Station to sing folk songs and lit listen to anti-war speeches. Beneath one of Tokyo's major city centers and one of the world's biggest and busiest stations, a movement of student sects and activists intersected with millions of commuters from all over Japan. Hardly marginal or illicit, this implicit activism, integral to the surfacing economic prosperity of the 60s, touched the everyday life of the Japanese citizen. In an attempt to bring the people of Japan into contact with political activism, the activists had sought to excavate new sites for populist political expression, as if reinforcing the pretext used by the police to remove them that in Japan there were no plaza spaces where pedestrians could gather. A train station, not a plaza or not a park, had become the new setting for performing democracy. This contradiction remained the intellectual subtext for a major competition, which was the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Complex competition two decades later. Kenzo Tange's winning entry to the right accommodated the city hall in twin high-rise towers facing the Shinjuku Central Park with a vast crescent-shaped citizens' plaza fronting the lower assembly building to its east. In what seemed like a summation of his five-decade search for democratic space, his scheme was in every way European in its formal conception, recalling the idea of a great cathedral fronting a figural space. Conversely, Aratazi Izusaki's entry, non-winning entry, to the left consciously refrained from proposing anything even remotely resembling a Western plaza. For him, the he, a Japanese term which means protesting masses, of the 1960s Shinjuku events had changed in their affinities to public space by the 1990s. He observed, to the extent that workable public space could no longer be attained in an outside space, sheltered indoor spaces, such as underground malls, atria, and internal circulation spaces are now being used as open spaces throughout the city. So his entry sought to create exactly this internalization. The entire complex was conceived around a vast axial covered space, doubling the interior volume of St. Peter's in Vatican. It was a linear sequence of mega atriums with a one to four vertical proportion, with a four to one vertical proportion, the walls of which began at the base with a massive arcade shooting up into the glass and steel lattice adorned with supersized banners. Contradicting democracy. If, if publicness is a barometer of democracy, then the theme park represents the nemesis of the Japanese plaza. During Japan's post-war economic miracle, Tokyo's rapid population influx and unprecedented land prices have caused many to settle on the city's outskirts. One response to this looming threat of uncontrolled urban sprawl and insufficient infrastructure was the new town of Tama, in, uh, incepted in 1965 to provide housing within, an unplanned, within a planned urban environment. Six years after the Meijimura Museum in Aichi Prefecture had pioneered the idea of the theme park in Japan in 1965, 
Gautama opened its first phase with neither a square nor a park, but actually a theme park of Sanria Puro land as its urban heart. While Tama was authentically the first true manifestation of the Japanese theme park, its establishment as a prototype must undoubtedly be given to Tokyo Disneyland. Tokyo Disneyland is indeed a Godzilla compared to its California original, some 20 acres bigger. But interestingly, Tokyo Disneyland is not an unapologetic replica of its American original. While the overall park mirrors in plan its American counterpart from entry to Main Street to the castle, to the Cinderella's castle roundabout, branching into the various worlds, there are differences. Uh, there are many. There is no New Orleans Square, and the steam train that circumambulates the Los Angeles Park runs around Adventureland here. But most visibly, most rides are narrated in Japanese. All signs and restaurant menus are printed in Japanese with English translation and small print, and almost all of the employees are natives. From the standpoint of Japanese democratic space, the success of the theme park affirms that by the late 1970s, the placelessness of the modern Japanese city had become the provocative intellectual context for newer dialogues and directions. Disneyland had, in fact, created a new paradigm of mass gathering that had traditionally only occurred during festivals. Overwhelming democracy. The idea of a public domain, free for populist expression, can unleash the uncanny nature of a nation's imagination. It can instigate an evolving culture's disparate voices beyond its political institutions and timeless traditions. Mass media, mass media, among other things, can become a way of making publicness vibrant in the face of its institutional irrelevance. The psychedelic streetscapes of Shinjuku, Ginza, and Akihabara embody this truism. Shinjuku, which you see here, hardly touched by the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake, became an attractive business hub after the, after, after the widespread destruction of many other places. Circa 1971, the Keio Plaza Hotel marked the opening of Japan's first skyscraper. And one of its squares, where dissident hippie gangs had lived during the 1960s, during the Shinjuku riots, became the site of an immense new department store called Studio Alta. So it was a very pioneering example. Because what it did is it displayed a colossal video screen incessantly spewing out cascades of images, setting dramatic precedents for things to come. And that's what you see in Shinjuku today. But the question is this, what meanings underlie this spectacle of mass media and communication? If the Western Plaza embodies Jurgen Habermas's advocacy for a deliberative democracy, in which he argues, does, does this semiotic Japanese street represent Chantal Mouffe's alternative of antagonistic democracy. Uh, the, the first one, Jürgen Habermas's advocacy, deliberative democracy, is grounded in the idea that there is a public sphere, which is an essential arena for populist deliberation and consensus towards the making of a sound democracy. The latter, Chantal Mouffe's antagonistic democracy, or agonistic democracy, as she calls it, the latter believes that democracy should be designed to optimize the expression of populist disagreement. In seeking to place opponents in adversarial rather than antagonistic roles, it makes democracy a process of contestation, and public space the material artifact of an evolving and messy process. Or does Shinjuku manifest instead the overwhelming of the Japanese public realm by the spectacle of Japanese consumerism? So to conclude, viewing democracy through the lens of the of the Japanese city affirms its inclusiveness and cultural pluralism. If democracy is but a legal text denoting its country of affiliation, then this indeed is its greatest strength. For all its political success or failure, democracy, the democracy is manifested only through cultural appropriation. Conversely, viewing the Japanese city through the democratic lens in turn beckons a rereading of the idea of the democratic city that in many ways seems contradictory to its Western counterparts. Whether this is a futuristic embodiment or an apocalyptic version of the modern metropolis, Tokyo today epitomizes Japan's post-industrial urban identity. If democracy then was a Western sociopolitical genome infused into the sinews of a prostrate nation, then manifesting democracy arguably was its predefined path towards modernity and beyond and towards its current unequivocal trends of globalization that increasingly characterize its seemingly stateless, borderless urban condition. Thank you.
Okay, I guess I, Vinayak, I was really interested in kind of these, what I think are pretty alternative sites in your kind of interpretation of publicness and democracy. Um, from the site of the plaza to the train station to theme parks to vertical signage. It's not something actually that I was ex expecting to see. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came upon these sites, um, why, what drew you in, why, why specifically um, um, these places, and why, you know, together, because they're very diverse in that way. So. Right. Uh, I, I, I think the, the I, I've lived in Japan. Uh, I was on, a, on, a, on an exchange program a long, long time ago, almost 20 years ago. My first introduction to Japan was almost at the age of 19, actually. Uh, so my first look at the Japanese city was just like anyone else, which is a great bias on the traditions of Japan, which are so dominant and so sublime compared to uh, India, for, for example, where I grew up. Uh, but as I delved deeper, the, the, th the, the thing that began to, to strike me, particularly in the context of Japan, was how the contemporary construct of Japanese culture all, always seemed to have a so-called external gaze. That, that well, you know, right from the Meiji Restoration by 1886, uh, if, you, if you look at what Japan really did, there was almost a very conscious embrace of looking at the West, almost to the point of um, not emulating it, but doing something else with it, which is almost uh, exhibiting it in a, in a very grotesque, way, but grotesque not in a, in a bad sense, but in a very intriguing sense. Uh, the, the sex, so, so the investigation really began when you began to ask yourself, uh, if, you, if you look at many of the plazas that were designed in the 60s, they are completely unused today. They are, they are not being used as the kind of plazas they were envisioned for. So as, a, as an urbanist, uh, the, the challenge was, is there a difference between intentions versus reception. And that's really the question I wanted to, to pose to you as well. So, so the, what led me to this investigation is, yes, architects during the time were obsessed with the idea of the Western Plaza and many other things. Uh, but they were intended for one thing, but they were received by the culture in a completely different way. And whether it was the empty plaza that represents the culture or the obsession or taking over of other alternative spaces that represents the negation of imported spaces, uh, is, a, is a cultural construct, which, which, which I was very intrigued with. But to, in that light, there was something you said which uh, struck a chord in me. You said, that, uh, you said that most of these designs, mm -hmm. most of these dresses were designed before they knew how they would sell. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, it sort of echoes the same idea. I mean, in, in a sense, we... we, we uh, it, but it, probably in fashion, it's easier because fashion is volatile. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily as permanent. But in the world of the built environment, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's enormously dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to sort of pose that question to you because uh, how do you see intentions versus reception in the world mm -hmm. of fashion? It's probably much easier mm -hmm. than the built environment. Well, I think um, it's the reason why, fast, uh, why clothing can be so cheap is because the people who lose out on the game are these wholesalers. So they absorb all the risk. And so um, it's really actually, and I'm Korean American, so I actually have to be really careful about the kind of field work, field research that I do because walking down the street, and I actually work with a photographer who's this like six foot tall, blonde, blonde haired, blue eyed woman. Um, because she actually, in some ways, has a lot more access than I do. Because I th always think that I'm a designer who's like scoping out their designs, work, and about to, you know, knock off and copy it. You know, and everything is uh, everything is about secrecy. And uh, but they're all producing in a lot of the same factories. But um, it's it's why the familial network is so important because. Um, you may not be able to trust, uh, you know, a designer that you hire, but if it's your daughter and she's graduated from Parsons and she speaks perfect English and she reads fashion magazines and she's doing market research constantly, then um, then you're you're going to um, feel a greater sense of trust of taking her design and wiring, you know. Fifty thousand dollars in cash to the factory in China to get it uh, 
to 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 get your like literally people are calling um, when they are actually in China, for instance, like they get phone calls that say, you know, because this profit margins are so slim. So by the end of the day, they'll just say, you know, how much do we sell? You know, how much cash is available to wire in the new uh, order, you know, in just a few hours. So, um, so it's, uh, you, your question was about intentions and, and, um, and what actually ends up happening. And um, every day in that district, uh, people s start new companies. And, you know, if uh, in one of those showrooms, you may have six to eight clothing lines, you know, in just one 500 square foot space. Um, but every day, lines and companies and businesses close every day. So it's it's a in incredibly volatile market. And but it's the the nervous system is there to so that we can enjoy uh, cheap and very fashionable fashion. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, please. Yeah, uh, this is maybe more an observation, uh, but I think a question, hopefully a question can come out of this. I think there's a really interesting connection and, and contrast between the mm -hmm. two. Uh, presentations, uh, and I think Bernard's kind of uh, discussion of uh, you know public space and democracy. Pub yeah, the, the notion of public space is uh, really problematic mm -hmm. in, yes. in East Asian context, and and, and uh, in I, mean, I, I would argue that there's actually no such thing as public, mm -hmm. at least tradi traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, in the Confucian you know social hierarchy. There's the individual, family, and the state. There's nothing in between. Nothing that defines uh, not, nothing in, in the liberal kind of Western liberal democracy concept of of the public is something that that holds the state accountable, um, and so that's I mean, that might be why you know the space is not being utilized because there's no concept of public, uh, but there are other kinds of kind of the, the more kind of vernacular kind of public space that uh, you know the the, the back alleys uh, those kind of things. So I think. And, and then, uh, it, it, on the other hand, there's a very strong kind of kinship network, which I think define how you know the the, the, the fashion kind of industry is kind of organized, uh, and this kind of very dense network of kind of reciprocity among individuals, among people who know each other, people from the same hometown, and those kind of relationship that has not been uh, acknowledged by this kind of you know the, the Western notion of kind of you know the state, public, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so I I can't help but making that that kind of uh, observation that thing is really interesting. But I think that's the kind of like twist to uh, what I observed that the, the twist to it though is like I had always read, there are lots of like journal articles and academic scholars who are writing about, you know, Asia and family on uh, family enterprises and entrepreneurs and kin networks. And I think for me what was really interesting um, uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up shadowing a couple of different um, designers to uh, different cities in China and was in there with, you know, uh, uh, at one business negotiation, at one table, you have like the designer, her interpreter, I was there, then you have like the factory manager who's like Korean Chinese, then you have the factory owner who's either Chinese or Japanese with their interpreters, you know. So you, you have like a business uh, to make capital and labor come together. You're at a table with like 15 people. And, and those, kin, those solid kin networks are so um, precarious and they're so f fake, you know. That's what was so, in, they're so real, but they're so, you know, in some instances that, it's, it w I feel like there was a lot of storytelling going on on why people could trust each other. And it was because of this, because we were all Asian, because we, we have, you know, and yeah, forget about these colonial histories all colliding in one space, but, you know. Yeah, it's definitely more nuanced than that. I mean, you know, family members compete against each other. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, I, mean, I don't mean to say that this is a kind of uh, homogenous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what was so interesting to me is how many twists and turns there were in, in considering this 
notion of diaspora. So, but but I think at the same time, what 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 was interesting to me in in investigating this was, yes, it is true that you know, you're absolutely right. Perhaps there is still in this culture a consciousness where democratic public public publicness doesn't exist. And you're right. If you go to Shinjuku, for example, this humongous intersection is a transition point where you just go past in the back alleys of all the life. I think what I was trying to investigate here was it occurred to me that there was, in fact, a very conscious attempt, even even to the point of writing about it, from these so-called intellectuals, and they were intellectuals, they are intellectuals, of really believing that democratic space was necessary. Mm -hmm to change society, mm -hmm. to bring, you know, so, so it was, it was and, and, and so the, 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 the idea was, could we pick them out? What were these paradigmatic examples that brought them? Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, the sequel, if, if I was to do one, would naturally be to expand this into what has actually emerged as publicness, not public space, but publicness. Uh, you know, for example, and, and, and the, the twist here is, in, in these forms of publicness, particularly in Japan, you find remnants of culture, but also mutations of culture. For example, one of the most dramatic scenes is the summer swimming pools, which I'm sure you've seen. You have hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of people that literally sit within a foot or mm -hmm. half, you know, six inches of each other, which is unthinkable in the United States. But it, it traces back to some beautiful aesthetic notions of Japanese culture, uh, one of which is called uh, chira chira uh, or chirari which is in fact, I mean, there's no term for it in the Western sense, but it's a little bit about voyeurism. So privacy is not about, privacy is implicit. Privacy is not about having a barrier and having a room. Um, things of the nature that uh, the underside of a kimono is much more decorative than the outer side. Mm -hmm. uh, so that a glimpse of the underside of the kimono is much more uh, uh, incredible as a moment than the normal pattern of the kimono you see. So these, these traces remain, but, the, the, but, but I, I would still argue that you know, what, what, what intrigued me was, the, like other countries, like India, like all these countries that became sovereign, there was an elite that truly believed, and this is what caught my attention, they really believed from the bottom of their heart, and I think they were, they were well-intentioned, they were not bad people, architects, politicians, socialists, that, they, that democracy needed imports of particular kind, whether it was the, the tower in Jakarta, the plaza in Japan, uh, you know, a new city in India. Uh, and and what, 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 what this sort of extends into is that there, there, what has happened in legacies is they've created Asian democracies, which is itself a subject that is worthy of discussion. What does democracy mean in Asia and what does it mean for democracy itself? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, and Christina, it's so great to see your work. Um, and I'm left with a question um, because I think of H&M, &M, mm -hmm. IKEA, that sort of oh, yeah. we know the brand, we know the nationality. Yeah. And, um, or Gap, you know, yeah. is a good old American brand. And so how do you take the sort of hidden Koreanness of, of these brands. Um, How do I take the hidden, hidden Koreanness oh of yeah. the brands? Okay. It's it's a, it's it's not marketed, exactly. in, at least in the list. U.S. Yeah. Um, as opposed in Southeast Asia, where of course Korea is a huge brand. Right. Um, so, what do you think about that? You know, it's like it's so funny because I think people are more. Um, um, with Forever 21, that large fast fashion retailer I was talking about, I think um, on the bottom of every fast, uh, on the bottom of all their yellow plastic bags, it says John 316, like written on it. And like when I first, I never knew Forever 21 to be a Korean company, but when I saw that Bible verse stamped on the bottom, that's, that's what the Bible verse. It says wow. John 3.16 on every single yellow bag. And you can watch tweens walk out of, you know, nobody walks out of Forever 21 with two items. They walk, you, that's a huge phenomenon on YouTube, Forever 21 hauls. You can watch girls talk about, I spent $60 today. Here are the two bags I, I bought. Let me go through what I, you know, style it for you, go through it, whatever. Um, 
and I never realized it was a Korean company until I purchased something from there and I saw what was on the on the bottom and that's when I and it's like the very it, it turns into the whole um, Korean American narrative of you know you know coming to this country working so hard you know having these skills uh, uh, pulling oneself up from the bootstraps and uh, having God and then and and donating to the church and the Korean community and then achieving the American dream, you know, and that's how it's always in the media played over and over and over again. Um, but I'm not so sure because I, I just heard that their stores are not doing very well in Asia. So it's wildly popular here and um, pretty popular, I think, in Europe as well, but not doing so well. Yeah, but it's ironic because Korean culture is very popular. Yes. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what that, yeah, I'm not sure what the, that marketing strategy is about, but I think there is a conscious effort to de-link, absolutely to de-link it, you know, within this American context. And to, I read this one, I, I call it odorless because I remember reading once an, an uh, a book, but it was many years ago, it was like 10 years ago, about, um, Japanese uh, electronic products in the 1980s and I, the author had come up with this term called odorless like these odorless products you know like you can't tell where it comes from quote unquote. it's not you know and and, so, and I think it's kind of similar in that in that way yeah like you know these electronics that are you thought you go in your home and you suddenly realize you have all these Japanese branded electronics but you don't read them as Japanese you know in the 1980s now it's a bit different but yeah. Also, the movement of these people, right? For the Korean, for the Brazilian. Brazil, this kind of friendly. I yeah. mean, so it's. I mean, speaking of borderless or the conditions of migration, yeah. right. it, it is a, it's a very different mapping of Asia, Asian urbanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to pick up on that because I thought both these presentations were very interesting about that because what I saw another commonality between the two presentations was presenting urbanity as a set of interrelated conditions. So, mm -hmm. you know, Los Angeles, Korea, Brazil, your notion of democracy and publicness, which is not just Japanese or Western. Of course, you know, as we know, there's no such thing as democracy. There are different types of democracy. Sure. I always sort of, you know, like Transpar Transparency International, all these people who do rankings of democracies. I mean, that's a kind of almost a neo-colonial enterprise that we are going to tell the rest of the world whether you're democratic or not. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, who the hell are you to tell us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there are variations of democracies and, you know, some of the discussions you had. But what uh, it brings to the point is this notion of this word that I hear a lot called hybrid, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a very lazy term. People throw it around all the time. Well, this is hybrid. Everything is hybrid. Indian culture is hybrid, Korean culture is hybrid. The, the challenge is hybrid in what ways and how, mm -hmm. which is like how do you map these relationships and sources and interpretations, which is not, which is the not lazy way of doing it, kind of being, you know, kind of what Christina does with kind of tracing these uh, relationships and patterns and how it happens actually. Because it will be very easy to say, well, that's a hybrid thing between Brazil, Japan, Korea, whatever, you know. Kind of that's the lazy when I, in urbanism that's become a very popular superficial way of describing things. So what I found interesting is kind of getting the specifics and the nature of relationships and how things flow from place to place mm -hmm. and how that maps on to the city. I think it's very fascinating because it, it reveals things. And I do believe that everything is hybrid. I mean, there's mm -hmm. show me one sort of, I don't know, maybe there exists some, something absolutely pure, like a pure culture, which is a kind of very mythical, that's a whole different discourse. So uh, I really enjoy that. The, the only thing I would add to that, Asim, is uh, to, uh, if, you, if you look at, you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, but what, what occurred to me as, as interesting in this, in this research was, uh, if you look at Iz Izosaki's project, for example, where he literally takes, I mean, literally, this is not a half-baked interpretation he literally takes Michelangelo's Campidoglio, like he, he just lifts it up and almost as a, 
has, a, has the sheer chutzpah of arguing that this is what Japan wants to be, almost like a, a tease, a literal tease. And this is what caught my attention. Or the or Kenzatange's you know, emulation of a Gothic cathedral in a massive building. Uh, I don't find that in, say, Corbusier's work. Uh, in, in, I, I guess what I'm saying is, if lazy is one word, maybe um, hypocritical is another. Because what, what I find timid in these other works is there is an effort to create polemics of hybridity. But what struck me about this work was there was no polemic. There was a polemic, but it was, you know, yes, I want to take the West and shove it down your throat. And that is what caught my attention. That it was, it was this belief that this country really needed to be impregnated with Western ideas throughout. And the question is, um, is that always a bad thing? I, I mean, this is the question I was left with. Because when you look at Japan today, it is the most interesting city. It is just the most complex, interesting, at least as an outsider, not as the insiders. So I, I wondered, because I had not encountered this in too many post-democratic societies, where you literally take a Western implant and just shove it down society, just put it down there. No arguments. I'm doing this. I believe this is right. And they were approved. They were, they were built. Well, it doesn't sound fun. I don't know, but it's, it, it, it caught my attention as a, please. Um, but as uh, impregnation without consent, I think, you're, to, to push your analogy, I think is the key. I mean, I don't know if we want to push that analogy, but um, you are certainly the self-colonizing. That's another measures, way of saying it. But um, is there a consensus in those cases? Somehow, well, power, dis you know, disproportionate power, power inequities are behind these things, one suspects. Right. And, 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 the, and this has been a phenomenon throughout Asia. I mean, if you look at Chandigarh, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the basic story of many Asian cities were after sovereignty, all the prime ministers claiming that the countries were democratic quite literally shoved down concepts down people's throats. Mm -hmm. And the legacy, as we presented in the book has been one of either appropriation, rejection, or some kind of an amazing acceptance. Or hybrid. Or hybrid, so to say. He's gone. I, um, I find it fascinating how your examination of uh, the fas fashion industry started in LA. And I guess my broader question is, do you see any emergence of Asian cities in the United States? And um, one prime example that comes to mind would be Flushing because are they, as, they, as Flushing is be developing with tall residential towers, are they carrying with them that their notion of what the public space is? Because now the public space is basically a big food court underneath the shopping mall. I think, I mean, I, I, I think I, uh, for today, I, I have some, you know, different, uh, I think I could have uh, located myself in Guangzhou or Shenzhen or Shanghai or Seoul, but I, I actually, it was a conscious thing that I wanted to present LA because I wanted to, um, and I think this was um, sort of said at the, maybe by you and I from the beginning, but I kind of wanted to unmoor this idea of Asia and Asian from an actual geographic uh, area studies kind of approach that I, I feel that I had been trained in and uh, I found very frustrating and limiting when I was going through school and, and trying to understand um, quote, the subjects that I was uh, interested in um, who were on the move, you know, and who were from um, um, many different histories, you know, and were um, yeah, I mean, uh, even in what you were saying, Asim, earlier with hybridity, like the thing that gets me really excited is a is the nuance that history brings to us. And um, when I think of your your comment on the Asian city in the U.S., for instance, or in Los Angeles, I think of you know Korean Brazilians when they left Brazil to come to Los Angeles one of the motivating reasons to come is because the Rodney King riots had burned down the businesses within the Korean community in Los Angeles. It weakened, that, the, the, it weakened their economics and they could easily come in and buy up the businesses in garments 
with cash because it was a very desperate situation. And so uh, I'm interested in kind of picking at what I think we normally just end up collapsing. So um, I don't know if that answers it, but yeah. But I mean, I, I will say that like, it really, I, I, uh, two years ago I was invited, I, I spoke at um, the Asian American Studies Association and I was like really shocked that they had it in Austin, Texas because they said that Texas actually had far surpassed the number of a Asians, you know, and that's a hugely, I mean, we could spend the next, you know, two years talk, trying to define that, but um, had surpassed the populations of, you know, Asians uh, as opposed to New York and and Los, Los Angeles even, I think. So it, there were more Asians in Texas than there were in any other place in the U.S. And so that kind of sort of blew my mind. Yeah. Or I, I think of cities like Vancouver, too. I mean, like, uh, that city is fascinating to me. And the fact that, like, uh, and, and, you know, the housing market, if we're complaining about the housing market here in Vancouver, the housing market has tripled in the last 10 years and there are empty it's kind of it kind of reminds you of shanghai like empty apartment buildings um because the landlords are you know in in china so it's so and everyone there is like half half asian so <laughs> <laughs> that is the asian city